Mine is the story of a man without a plan. Uh, I was an academic and uh, pursued an academic life. Then I became the dean of the university of, uh, where I worked. Then I went into government accidentally and I became the minister of development, it was called, which included industry and trade and uh, development. From there... In which country? Uh, in Venezuela. In Venezuela. In Venezuela. Uh, and from there, uh, I became, um, uh, I went uh, uh, to the board of directors of the World Bank in Washington, uh, where I, it was quite an experience. Then I became a member of a think tank, the Carnegie Endowment, uh, many years ago. Uh, and I was doing what people in think tanks do, which is write and, and comment. Then I became the editor of a magazine uh, called Foreign Policy, and I did that for 14 years. Um, and after that, I became a columnist, uh, and now I do also I do all of that. I write columns that are published around the world. I write books, uh, and I do a lot of television programs. Since um, as the, the career that I described uh, created many opportunities for me to observe power up front closely, uh, and sometimes experience it when I was in government. And, uh, and I always was fascinated by the gap between what people thought was the, the power of someone uh, in a cabinet position, uh, the minister, and the actual power that I had at the time. And I thought that that was because of my, uh, my inexperience, I was very young, or because my country, Venezuela, was very dysfunctional uh, and very weak in terms of the state uh, structures. But then I talk, started talking first to my colleagues and they all felt the same way. Then I had the opportunity when I was at the World Bank to talk with a lot of leaders from a wide variety of countries in Eurasia and Africa and Asia and the rest of Latin America. And I would probe that and I would discover that many felt the same way as I did. That there was a... a, a power was becoming very hard to, to obtain, to use, uh, and, and, and very easy to lose. Um, and so I then started looking at it more carefully. Then I was the editor of Foreign Policy magazine for more than a decade. And as uh, the editor of that magazine, that also put me in touch with a lot of people with power, but also with a lot of people studying and understanding and, and viewing what was happening. So I started writing about it. And so I wrote The End of Power, that uh, in many ways that title is a misnomer. I'm not saying that power has ended and the world doesn't have uh, pockets of power highly concentrated. The Pentagon and the Vatican, the Chinese Communist Party and the Kremlin and Google and Facebook uh, and Goldman Sachs or ExxonMobil, these are centers, institutions and individuals that have a lot of power. So my point is different. My point is that in the 21st century, power has become easier to acquire, harder to use and easier to lose. So it's happening everywhere. Uh, it's happening in Italy with Cinque Stelle and Beppe Grillo. It's happening in Spain with Podemos. Uh, it's happening in Europe where you have all kinds of new parties coming out of nowhere. You can see it in Poland and you could see it in uh, uh, Hungary and, and elsewhere. Uh, in Asia, uh, in Latin America, of course. What do they have in common? Well, these are what I call the micropowers. They come out of nowhere. They have improbable origins. They have uh, people at the, at the beginning disdain them and give them no chance of winning. And then they are able uh, to displace what I call the mega players, the traditional power structures that have dominated this, the political scene for, for a long time. And so these newcomers displace them. But my point is wider than that because I say, and I think it, I can prove that this is happening not just in the realm of politics, it's also happening in, in the area of war, of business, of media, of communications, of art and culture and science. Wherever there is human activity, organized human activity, and therefore power matters, you will see that power is becoming far more feeble and more constrained, but also easier to acquire. So from that perspective, people have now power, 
if I'm right, are very constrained in the way they can use it. And we are already seeing it in the case of Trump. He came with a wide uh, uh, agenda of things that he was going to do immediately. And well, we are seeing how he has not been able to do much uh, and how he's going to, he's facing already a lot of uh, uh, upheaval around uh, his presidency. What will happen, um, there is going to differ from place to place. In, the, in some places, uh, anarchy uh, will be common and they will have a very frequent turnover of who is in power. But in other places, we're going to see political innovations of the good kind. If you think about it, we live surrounded by innovations in all aspects of our lives, except in the way we govern ourselves. So innovation is everywhere, but we still pick our leaders and, and govern ourselves and monitor the government and accountability and, um, and, uh, and participation and how to uh, organize different interests and how to work in a democracy are still uh, done in the same way that they were done a uh, hundred years ago. So I predict that there is gonna, we are at the verge of a wave of political innovation that is going to be very positive in some places. In other places, there will be political innovation of a horrible kind. Will there be new revolutions, given the culture of mistrust? It's easy to predict that because it's already happening. Give me the name of a country where people are not in the streets. People are in the streets everywhere. People are protesting for a variety of things either because they are belong to the middle class of countries like the United States and uh, Europe that feels embattled and threatened and under siege, or because they belong to the new middle class in India and Mexico and Indonesia and Turkey and China. The new middle class that now has expectations, that has been empowered, that is better educated, that is more connected, they are also taking to the streets for different reasons. But around the world, people are protesting because political parties are no longer providing them the channels to articulate, to organize, to express uh, their grievances and their aspirations.